John Calvin delves deeply into the concept of human incapacity to perform righteous actions independently, emphasizing the crucial role of divine grace in spiritual transformation. He contends that the pervasive corruption of human nature is beyond self-remedy and requires divine intervention. This intervention is not merely assistance, but a profound conversion of the human will, rooted in the regeneration described in the scriptures. Calvin references the Apostle Paul's encouragement to the Philippians, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 6. He interprets this good work as God's initiation of spiritual rebirth that redirects the human will towards righteousness and sustains it to persevere in faith. This is not just a support to the will, but a complete overhaul and reorientation from its natural state. To further illustrate the necessity of divine renewal, Calvin cites Ezekiel 36, 26, 27, where God promises to replace a stony heart with a heart of flesh and instill his spirit within individuals to empower them to follow his laws. He employs the analogy of softening a stone to accentuate that the human heart, like stone, is incapable of moral metamorphosis unless entirely recreated by God. Calvin stresses that this renewal entails a total regeneration of the will, recreated not in its existence but in its orientation, from evil to good. The initial will is abolished insofar as its corrupt inclinations are concerned, but its heart as will remains now redirected by God. Through this theological framework, Calvin affirms the exclusivity of divine action in the work of salvation and sanctification, asserting that humans have no part in engendering their righteousness. The entire process of turning towards rectitude is the work of God alone, highlighting the dependency of mankind on divine grace for any good. This perspective indicates that human efforts are ineffectual without God's life-changing intervention. Also, Calvin firmly maintains that the entirety of human salvation is solely the work of God, explicitly negating any contribution from human will. He grounds his argument in biblical scripture, particularly the writings of the Apostle Paul. For instance, Paul's assertion in 2 Corinthians 3, 5 that humans lack the inherent ability to produce godly thoughts or actions independently points out Calvin's view that any righteous inclination in human will is imparted solely by divine grace. Calvin expands on this by referencing Philippians 2.13, where Paul states that it is God who actively works within us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. This statement is pivotal for Calvin as it attributes every positive aspect of the human will directly to God's intervention, leaving no room for human merit in the process of salvation. Moreover, he cites 1 Corinthians 12, 6, clarifying that all virtuous traits in believers are gifts from God. This idea is reinforced through the concept of believers being a new creation in Christ, as mentioned in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, and Ephesians 2, 10, which posits that our natural state is wholly altered by divine action, oriented towards preordained good works. This shift is not a bare enhancement, but a total recreation, indicating that salvation is entirely unmerited. Calvin uses Psalm 100, 3, to demonstrate that even our identity as God's people, our regeneration and the ensuing spiritual life, is not our achievement but solely the result of God's creative act. He reiterates that this divine act leaves no space for human boasting, as it strips humanity of all claims to the work of salvation. Calvin's theology thus places all glory squarely with God repeating the total depravity of man and the overwhelming, irresistible grace of God in the process of spiritual regeneration. This interpretation not only underlines the gratuitous nature of salvation, but also aims to inspire humility and reverence towards God's omnipotent role in redemption. Furthermore, Calvin firmly rejects the notion that human will collaborates as an active participant with divine grace in the salvation process. He critiques interpretations, especially those of Lombard, which misread Augustine's teachings to suggest that, once divinely prepared, the human will act alongside grace. According to Calvin, this dilutes the true, scripture-based transformational energy of grace. Calvin clarifies that the human will, inherently averse to righteousness, is wholly and unilaterally converted by God's intervention— God corrects the corrupted will and replaces it with one inclined towards goodness.
For Calvin, divine grace is not slightly an initiator, but the sole sustainer of will, refuting any notion of a cooperative process involving human effort. Using Augustine's metaphor of the will as a handmaid to grace, Calvin underscores the will's subordinate role. It follows grace's lead, utterly relying on divine prerogative. This interpretation counters Chrysostom's view that grace cannot do anything without will, nor will anything without grace, by emphasizing that grace itself instigates and maintains the will towards good. Calvin's exposition seeks to cement the idea that human merit plays no part in salvation. It's a grace-driven metamorphosis from start to finish. He cites Augustine extensively to show that God not only makes the unwilling willing, but also preserves this new will to ensure that human actions conform to divine intent. Augustine's words, that God is the teacher who instructs by the grace of the Spirit, ensuring that those who learn can also desire and act righteously, are central for Calvin's case. In summary, Calvin's perspective places him firmly within the Reformation's doctrinal debates, accentuating the absolute sovereignty of divine grace and the entire dependency of human will on God's life-changing intervention. This foundation showcases the crucial Reformation principle of sola gratia, salvation by grace alone, with no human cooperation. In addition, Calvin, a central figure in the Reformation, affirms that all beneficial attributes and inclinations in humans are conferred by God, a foundational aspect of Reformed theology. He anchors his claim in Scripture, posturing it as the unequivocal source of this doctrine, while also aligning his perspectives with Augustine to enhance their theological credibility. Calvin supposes that the inception of any good within individuals does not stem from human nature or will, but originates solely from God, specifically through his sovereign act of election. According to Calvin, before the creation of the world, God selected certain individuals to receive his grace free from any human merit. This divine selection underpins the renewal of the human will from its natural state inclined towards evil to one capable of good, entirely through divine grace. He substantiates his contention by discussing the human will's shift as depicted in Scripture, where God replaces a heart of stone with a heart of flesh. This metaphorical transformation is extensively exemplified through prophetic books like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, which describe God's initiative in instilling new righteous desires and inclinations in humans. These passages assert that any emergence of a righteous will is purely a gift from God, not a result of human effort or decision. Further, Calvin highlights that Scripture consistently attributes the origin of faith and righteous action to God's free gift. This stance challenges the notion that humans possess an innate ability to choose good over evil, indicating instead that every helpful moral action and inclination is divinely implanted. Basically, Calvin's writings serve to maintain the great dependence of humanity on divine grace for all that is good, marking human will and righteousness as products not of human origin, but of divine intervention and regeneration. This principle is a cornerstone of Calvinist theology, pointing out the total sovereignty of God in matters of human salvation and morality. Additionally, Calvin's theological perspective, as articulated in his reflections on the prayers of Scripture, reiterates the absolute reliance of human blessedness on the divine. He dissects prayers from prominent biblical figures like Solomon and David, using them to clarify the natural defiance and corruption of the human heart against God's commandments. Solomon's plea for God to incline our hearts, 1 Kings 8.58, and David's request for a new pure heart, Psalm 51.10, repeat the doctrine that any movement towards righteousness is initiated and sustained by God alone. Calvin underlines that these prayers not only demonstrate an awareness of the heart's impurity, but also affirm that rectitude in humans is wholly wrought by God. This interpretation aligns with his broader theological claim that human nature is utterly depraved and incapable of providing for its salvation. He extends this debate using Christ's analogy of the vine in John 15, where Jesus states that without him, humans can produce no good, akin to a vine's branch that cannot bear fruit when severed from its source of nourishment. This metaphor for Calvin vividly portrays the nullity of human ability apart from divine grace. Also, Calvin addresses potential objections that might suggest a synergistic relationship between divine grace and human will.
He refutes such views decisively, drawing on Paul's declaration in Philippians 2.13 that God is the originator of both the will and the action in any good deed. This theological stance is absolute in attributing all actions and desires conducive to righteousness solely to God's operative force. To sum up, Calvin's exegesis on prayer encapsulates a view where God is the sole architect of human virtue, from the inception of a righteous will to its perseverance and execution. This core leaves no space for human autonomy in spiritual matters, arranging all credit and dependency on God, thereby eliminating any basis for human pride. Moreover, Calvin robustly confronts the traditional view that divine assistance is a minor bid awaiting human acceptance. Calvin critically examines and repudiates this belief by debating that it diminishes the metamorphic and sovereign nature of God's grace. Calvin refutes the idea, historically attributed to Chrysostom, that God draws individuals in a manner that allows them to choose cooperation with divine intent. He disputes that this view fails to acknowledge the depth of human depravity and the requisite potency of divine intervention. Instead, Calvin underscores that true divine grace is not a passive, optional offering, but an active, irresistible force that effectively changes the chosen individuals, aligning them with God's will. He supports his discussion with scriptural references such as Ezekiel 11.19 and 36.27, which delineate that God's promise involves not only the provision of a new spirit, but also the assurance that this spirit leads to actual compliance with his commands. Further, he interprets John 6.45 as evidence that those who learn from the Father are inevitably drawn to Jesus, emphasizing the effectiveness of God's call. Calvin draws heavily on Augustine's thoughts from De Predestinatione Sancta to enunciate a vision of grace that is selective and efficacious. Augustine criticizes the notion that grace is a merit-based reward accessible through human effort. Instead, he accentuates it as a manifestation of God's unilateral election and sovereignty. In essence, Calvin argues against the concept of a neutral grace that individuals can either accept or reject. He introduces the doctrine of effectual perseverance, which affirms that the elect are infallibly guided and kept by God's strength, exhaustively independent of human agency. This perspective not only reaffirms God's absolute sovereignty, but also asserts human reliance on divine grace for salvation, categorically rejecting synergistic interpretations of salvation. Furthermore, Calvin vehemently contends that the concept of perseverance is solely an act of divine grace and not a consequence of human effort or merit. He critically addresses the prevalent but erroneous belief that God's perseverance is a reward for human merit or a response to the initial grace received by individuals. According to this belief, individuals have the autonomy to either accept or reject God's grace. Calvin refutes this, highlighting that such a view erroneously suggests that salvation hinges on human actions. Calvin indicates that while it may seem that those who utilize initial grace will receive more grace, this is not a merit-based reward but rather a continuation of God's free gift. He cites biblical passages such as Matthew 25, 21, 23, 29, and Luke 19, 17, 26, which suggest an increase in grace for those who are faithful with little. However, he cautions against interpreting these verses as a commercial transaction between God and man. Discussing Augustine's terms, operating and cooperating grace, Calvin explains that Augustine meant these not as a partnership between divine and human efforts, but as God's sole action where he starts and then accomplishes the work of grace. This depicts that all good initiatives, including human willingness to respond to divine prompting, are fully orchestrated by God, as Apostle Paul supports in Philippians 2.13, maintaining that both the will and the action are instigated by God for his pleasure. Calvin differentiates between correct and incorrect interpretations of grace's functionality post-conversion. He agrees that a believer naturally follows the promptings of the Holy Spirit due to the consistent nature of God's transformative work within. Conversely, he condemns the notion that humans can add independently to their salvation, labeling this a perilous misconception. In summation, Calvin's discourse on perseverance points out the absolute sovereignty of God in salvation, attributing all actions and decisions that lead to spiritual endurance to divine grace, thereby eliminating any grounds for human boasting.
In addition, Calvin critically focuses on the interpretation of divine grace and human effort through his analysis of the Apostle Paul's declaration in 1 Corinthians 15.10. I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Calvin debates against the common misinterpretation that suggests Paul views himself as a co-laborer with grace. He clarifies that Paul attributes the entirety of his labor to the grace of God alone, thereby negating any claim of personal merit. According to Calvin, the error stems from a flawed translation and understanding of the Greek text, which some have taken to imply that grace was hardly assisting Paul, rather than being the sole effective force in his efforts. Calvin reiterates that Paul's statement, It was not I, but the grace of God that was present with me, credits all labor to the divine grace, thus upholding the doctrine that humans cannot claim any good work independent of God's grace. Calvin supports his exchange by referencing Augustine, who expresses that while human will might precede certain divine gifts, it does not precede the will to do good, as even the good will is a gift from God. Augustine uses scriptural backing from Psalm 59, 10, The God of my mercy shall precede me, and Psalm 23, 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me, to embody that God's grace both initiates and sustains the human will towards righteousness. Further, Bernard of Clairvaux emphasizes this theological view by describing the church's plea for divine guidance expressing a desire for God to mold human reluctance into willingness and inertia into action. Through these discussions, Calvin unequivocally establishes that all merits of human efforts are owed entirely to God's transformational and sustaining grace, without which no righteous deed can be accomplished by man alone. This fundamental view repeats the serious dependence of human righteousness on divine grace, affirming that every good work is fundamentally the fruit of God's enabling spirit, Besides, Calvin leverages the theological insights of Augustine to address contemporary criticisms that Reformed teachings conflict with early Christian thought. These critiques, reminiscent of the ancient disagreements between Pelagius and Augustine, are revived by the sophists at the Sorbonne, who allege a fundamental opposition between Protestant doctrines and Christian antiquity. Calvin's defense utilizes Augustine's work, De Corruptione et Gratia, to utter a nuanced comprehension of human will and divine grace, specifically contrasting the conditions of Adam before the fall and humanity after the fall. According to Augustine, Adam possessed the freedom to continue in righteousness contingent upon his will to do so. This form of freedom, however, was limited to the capacity to avoid sinning, a capacity that Adam failed to utilize. In comparison, Augustine postulates that contemporary believers are endowed with a more thorough form of freedom, not only to will against sin, but also to actualize this will through the enablement of the Holy Spirit. This new freedom ensures that believers are not only able to choose righteousness, but are reconstructed to pursue it inherently. Calvin underlines that Augustine saw divine grace as not simply assisting the human will, but as essential and continuously active. This grace ensures that the human will does not succumb to sin and temptation by reinforcing and directing it towards godliness. Augustine underscores that all righteous deeds performed by believers are not through human effort, but are the fruits of divine grace shaping and compelling the will. Through these points, Calvin aligns his views with Augustine's, showing that the need of grace for salvation and righteous living is a consistent theme in Christian theology. He disputes against the notion that grace solely facilitates human action, instead presenting it as the metamorphic force that ensures and produces godliness in the believer's life. This theological stance is climactic in refuting semi-Pelagian interpretations that underplay the role of divine intervention in human salvation and sanctification. Calvin's use of Augustine thus aids to bridge Protestant beliefs with central Christian doctrines, emphasizing a continuity that transcends centuries and doctrinal disputes. Last but not least, Calvin elaborates on Augustine's views regarding the relationship between human will and divine grace, accentuating that the renewal and operation of human will are entirely contingent upon grace. Calvin interprets Augustine's writings to clarify that while human will remains intact, its ability to choose good over evil is not autonomous, but is made possible solely through divine grace.
This grace is selectively bestowed according to God's sovereign will, not distributed universally nor reliance on human merits. Calvin references Augustine's correspondence with Boniface to affirm that grace is a free gift from God, granted independently of human actions or deserts. In these writings, Augustine argues against the notion promulgated by Pelagius that grace is a reward for human merit. Instead, Augustine insists that grace is essential for any good action, fundamentally unmerited and helps not as a recompense but as a constitutional enablement for virtuous deeds. Additionally, in De Corruptione et Gratia, Augustine delineates his doctrine. First, he states that liberty to obtain grace is not a product of human will, but rather grace itself is what enables human will to be free. Second, grace not only converts the will, but also delights and strengthens it, ensuring perseverance through spiritual fortitude. Third, the persistence of the will in goodness is secured by grace. Absent grace, the will succumbs to failure. Fourth, the initial turning of the will towards good and its subsequent constancy are solely the effects of divine mercy. Also, Augustine presupposes that both the direction of the will towards good and its endurance in that state are exclusively governed by God's will. Through these points, Calvin contends against any perception of free will that suggests human freedom from divine influence. According to Augustine, as presented by Calvin, genuine free will is the capacity to pursue godliness. Yet this capacity and its execution depend utterly on grace, affirming human dependence on God for all righteous pursuits. In conclusion, Calvin dives into the weighty incapacity of humans to perform righteous deeds independently, asserting the indispensable role of divine grace in spiritual shift. He debates that human nature is intrinsically corrupt and further self-redemption. This condition calls for a radical divine intervention that fully reorients and remodels the human will, a concept rooted acutely in the regeneration described in the scriptures. Moreover, Calvin utilizes scriptural references to anchor his logics, notably citing the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1, 6, which he interprets as divine initiation of spiritual rebirth. This rebirth redirects human will towards righteousness and sustains it, highlighting that the transformation is thorough, not merely supportive. Furthermore, he epitomizes this essentiality through Ezekiel 36, 26, 27, which discusses God replacing a stony heart with a heart of flesh and instilling his spirit within individuals to follow his laws, indicating the incapacity of the human heart for moral conversion, unless entirely recreated by God. In addition, his theology maintains the exclusivity of divine action in salvation and sanctification, pointing out that humans give nothing to their righteousness. The reorientation towards rectitude is solely God's work. This view is supported by additional Pauline texts such as 2 Corinthians 3, 5, and Philippians 2.13, which reiterate that any righteous inclination or act of the human will is purely a result of divine grace. Lastly, Calvin critiques theological interpretations that suggest a cooperative role between human will and divine grace in salvation. He repeats the reliant role of human will, which he describes as a handmaid to grace, subordinate to God's overriding initiative. Through these questionings, Calvin underlines the total sovereignty of divine grace in salvation, sola gratia, underscoring that all aspects of human righteousness and moral capability are divinely bestowed, leaving no room for human merit and placing all glory with God. This groundwork not only emphasizes the gratuitous nature of salvation, but also aims to encourage humility and reverence towards God's omnipotent role in redemption.